Hey everybody, how's it going? I am your host Adrian coming to you almost live from lovely Petaluma, California here in Studio MC2 at Quicksurf Internet Studios. The Geekinator is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Do feel free to head on over to techpodcast.com and check out all the other technology related shows over there as well. I'd like to encourage everybody to visit us online over at quicksurf.com. Please do subscribe to the show if you have not already done so. Uh, we've got a variety of ways of subscribing and they're all linked up in the show notes. Um, so feel free to do that if you haven't already done so. And if you have, thank you uh, so much for subscribing and following the show and uh, providing support. Let's go ahead and get into some of the cool stuff I found for this episode. Over at uh, Hackaday, there's a uh, blog post here, a DIY or do-it-yourself 250-pound thrust liquid oxygen slash kerosene rocket. Now, this is not for the faint of heart, and definitely if you're a child or even an adult, do not do this without supervision. <laughs> this is pretty cool. Uh, basically, the post starts off, Robert's rocket project has been going on for a long time. It's been around so long that you can go all the way back to posts from 2001 where he talks about getting his first digital camera. So the website that he's got is dedicated to his pursuit of liquid-fueled rocket engine building. It's a great project log, and he has finally come to the point where he, he will be testing his first flight vehicle soon. So uh, this particular post is about the 250-pound thrust regeneratively cooled rocket engine. It uses kerosene as the fuel and liquid oxygen as the oxidizer. Um, the cool thing about it is he utilizes the temperature change of the liquid oxygen expanding to cool the chamber and nozzle before being burned. This is actually uh, something that a lot of modern rocket engines do. And this allows for a very efficient and powerful combustion of the fuel. He also has some videos of testing it on his site, so it's pretty neat. Definitely check it out. They've got a photo here up on uh, Hackaday, and it is pretty epic. So definitely take a look. From makezine.com in the Lego realm, the Lego drum machine runs on automatic. British artist Alex Almont built Clunky Drummer. This is what he calls it. The This elegant one-motor Lego drum machine with an Arduino, a protoshield on top, wired with a Lego Power Functions uh, power connector, a digital delay pedal, and a drum computer, uh, MFB522. The latter two are controlled by the motor as well. The Lego mallets bang on piezo transducers to digitize the beats. Uh, as an art piece, Clunky Drummer is meant to be activated and then left alone. So uh, it looks pretty cool, actually. I'm, 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 you know, they've got a Vimeo video of it here, and it's. I'm like, wow, this is, this is pretty awesome. Definitely uh, take a look if you want to make music with Legos. From Hackaday, Smart Citizen, an Arduino compatible. It's Arduino compatible and packed with sensors. If you're going to develop another Arduino compatible board these days, you might as well take a kitchen sink approach. And I'm using air quotes here for those of you who are listening and not watching. The Smart Citizen kit piles it on, including Wi-Fi, an SD slot, uh, an EE prom on its base. The attached shield, dubbed the ambient board, is a buffet of sensors. You get temperature, humidity, uh, CO, NO2, light intensity, and a microphone for reading sound levels. The board's intended purpose is to provide an open source interactive environmental database, excuse me, by crowdsourcing data from multiple smart citizen kits, but you can add your own stuff or yank the shield off altogether. So you can, uh, there are also other shields that are under, under development. Uh, aimed at providing agricultural data, monitoring biometrics, and more. So this is actually pretty neat. Um, you know, I mean, there's no reason why you sh you shouldn't do something of that nature. I mean, if you're going to do a shield where you want, you know, sensors, you know, because, I mean, that's the one thing that Arduino has going for it is it's really easy to wire up sensors and get a good, you know, good number of sensors going and some type of connectivity that allows you to talk to these sensors. So pretty interesting. From uh, news.com, a Lego version of the world's largest ship sets sail. That's right. 
Owners of the new Lego version of the Maersk line Triple E might be tempted to smash a bottle of champagne against it once they're done building, given that it's a model of the world's largest ship. Alas, the model would probably smash to bits. Still, Maritime and Lego fans alike may want to rush out in January and buy the new $150 set. It's comprised of 1,518 bricks. The Lego Maersk Triple E recreates the real ship with what the toy company says is a high attention to detail. And they've got a shot here, and it is pretty big. Amazingly big. From The Verge, I just had to include this. A colossal chart compares hundreds of sci-fi's greatest spaceships. Uh, the world of sci-fi has brought us countless spaceships and other galaxy-hopping vessels, but no one's ever brought them all together quite like this. Dirk Lochelle has charted out a massive size comparison, and we are talking massive size comparison of ships from dozens of fictional worlds, as you'd expect, iconic franchises like Star Trek, Star Wars, and Battlestar Galactica are, are represented. But he also branches out to other sci-fi universes as well, such as Warhammer 40,000. Uh, you'll see ships that have appeared in films like Independence Day, Alien vs. Predator, and WALL-E. Uh, video games aren't left out either. EVE Online, Halo, Dead Space, StarCraft. It, it is a massive chart. It is humongous. And some of these ships, the scale and size of some of these ships makes other ships that you thought were pretty big look just ridiculously small. <laughs> I mean, it is awesome. Definitely check this out. From Hackaday, an improvised AT-Tiny 2313 logic analyzer. I think I talked about this before. I may have, may, maybe not. Uh, after banging his head against a wall trying to get a PS2 interface to work, Jonas decided he needed a dedicated logic analyzer. He didn't need anything fancy. Writing bits to serial port would do. So he came up with a very, very simple ATtiny 2313 based logic analyzer that can capture 50 plus kilohertz, which is more than enough for a PS2 port. So definitely check this out if you're looking for a tiny logic analyzer that is relatively simple. From Engadget, Pebble goes up for sale through AT&T store starting September 27th. That's right, Pebble, the massively kickstarted e-ink watch that connects to your smartphone, is about to become available at AT&T stores. Well, this is written uh, about a week ago, so is available at AT&T stores. Um, both uh, brick and mortar and online store will sell the device for $150 with availability starting online this month and expanding to physical stores at some point in October. AT&T touts its exclusivity as the exclusive carrier for the hot new Pebble smartwatch. Uh, the watch has also been available via Best Buy for some time now. So pretty awesome. Definitely take a look, especially if you're looking for something of that nature. Should be pretty cool. That will do it for this edition of the Geekinator. As always, everything we've talked about is linked up in the show notes, which you can find online over at quicksurf.com. Please do subscribe to the show if you have not already done so. And with that, I will see all of you on the next episode. See you then. Bye.